So this is this is going to be a little bit of an improvised session. Like I, I, I knew that I wanted to tell something about this, but I have not really thought about that. I, I have not really practiced or have not really been discussing with other people, like how to best explain the relation from like well, how we've been working over the last few days with <coughs> with the tutorials towards going to large scale analysis and and how that relates to open science. But I've I'll, I'll try to make a case for it. And I hope that we're going to have a very interactive session. So I've, I've prepared a bunch of slides. At a certain point, I will sit down because I want to show you some details, um, like some details on the GitHub, etc. Um, but the, the idea of, of this talk is that I want to uh, want to discuss with you, like not not to explain to you, but want to discuss with you, like how to scale up from from pilot analysis, as we've more or less been doing over the last few days, working on the single subjects where you already know more or less what like it's. It's it's it, this is a, the typical subject, like it's a good subject. It's not the average subject, and in this in this single subject, which is a good subject, we can basically explore all the different features that we have in the data, and then the, the subject was picked such that we could actually show all these effects. But that's of course of what you do with a, with a pilot analysis. And but at a certain point, you have to switch your style of working from this pilot analysis, from this exploratory analysis, where you're double dipping, triple dipping, you're doing statistical tests multiple times. And even though we're do using clustering to correct for multiple comparisons, we're doing multiple tests anyway, because we want to compare them, etc. Uh, but at a certain point, you have to go to this publication quality group analysis. And then you want to make sure that you are not doing any f f f reporting any false alarms. And <coughs> um, over the last few days, you've been working, uh, we started off on Monday uh, with um, with, an, with, a, with an empty MATLAB session. And, and we've, you've been working in copying and pasting parts of the field trip tutorials into a MATLAB script. And some of you have been working, like making nice scripts out of it, and some of you, I, I see, st I still see quite messy scripts. But I think once you start scaling up to a large analysis with a large group, as most of you will have, like 10 subjects, 20 subjects, sometimes even more, uh, you s have to start thinking about like how do you analyze your data, how do you analyze your scripts, and how do you analyze your, uh, sorry, how do you organize your data, how do you organize your scripts, and how do you organize your results. And, and during the last few days it was easy because it was only one subject, so it didn't really matter where the script was. Wha and what I then want to do is I want to move into open science. I want to talk about a few, th few topics such as BITS, the brain imaging data structure for organizing your data. I want to touch upon repositories. <coughs> for sharing your data, and I want to talk about version control and publication of your analysis details. Now th this is something that I've already been discussing with some of you during, during dinner um, on, uh, on Tuesday evening and during, during lunch, uh, but it's, it's something that, I'm really, that I really care about because I think it's really important for uh, moving science forward. But if it's about sharing of data, and especially data from human subjects, what most, most of us are working on, of course there's legal issues and there's privacy concerns that are important to take, take into account. So that's also something that I want to touch upon. And then of course there's some practical issues. So what I've done is I've, I've collected a whole bunch of slides and I, I hope that it more or less covers, covers this overview. Uh, but please interrupt me if you think, if you want to discuss something else, okay? Or if you, if you, if you have ideas <coughs> that you want to share with us, because I'm not claiming that I'm the expert here on all of these topics. It just happens to be that I might have spent more time thinking about this. So, for moving from single subject versus group analysis, for myself, uh, a very important change came when I was invited to participate in the Human Connectome Project, which was not about doing 10 or 20 subjects, but all of a sudden we had this plan to s start scanning 1,200 subjects in a five-year period. And the whole plan was that the first two years we would actually plan the whole project, then we would start, start scanning, and would start analyzing all the data in the same way throughout the whole three-year period at, at the end. So that, that was actually quite a challenge because up to then we always had been working with um, pilot subjects and then we move from the pilots more or less into the final phase and we just record our subjects and analyze the subjects along the way. And within the Human Connectome Project we were forced to start thinking ahead because it was such a such an ambitious project. So let me just go to the, let's see where my mouse is, here. No. Nope. 
so the human contact home project I, I I presume that most of you are familiar with this is that is that correct like other people who don't know the human contact home project okay so the human contact home project is a is a project that was granted uh, by the uh, previous US government uh, as in to a consortium uh, and the plan was to make a large uh, database uh, of results for for discovery science so the plan was actually to acquire data and to share the data the plan was not to address any new scientific question uh, but the ambition was to create a database according to the best standards at that time and I think that's pretty much still the best standard that we have now so within that project we started off with um, certain ambitions, like we want, we want to have sufficient uh, um, variance in the group, but we, we we're not. But the, the group had to be limited in size because there was only so many million U uh, U.S. dollar available. So we settled on 1,200 subjects, and we decided to only include young adult subjects, like normally developing young, young adult subjects. But we wanted to like maximally exploit those subjects, so we we picked them from a twin database and we also included family members. So that, that means that the subjects have been samples, sampled from the population in such a way that there's a lot of genetic structure that can be exploited during the analysis. And subsequently, those subjects were scanned extensively. So they were actually invited for the, for the, into the lab for, for, for two or three days. So normally we have a subject in the scanner for one hour. So these subjects spent quite some more hours in the scanner. But we, we did not only include uh, MRI scans and in a subset MEG scans, we also included a very extensive cognitive test battery. There was blood samples were taken, so uh, uh, blood serum analysis was done, uh, saliva samples were taken, and genetics was determined, as I already said. So this results in a very large database, and in this whole process, uh, with, a, with a large team of, of of uh, researchers involved, we tried to optimize the analysis in such a way that we would basically get the best quality database. And this, uh, since then, this has uh, actually moved on. So the project was like w was completed reasonably well in time. So we actually, after not after five years, but actually after six and a half years, we had released our 1,200th subject. <coughs> uh, so this database is now available, and now the same group. Uh, is working on extending this database with with other populations, and that's why we now have the connectome coordination f uh, facilities. But the HCP young adult, that's the one that started it off. And what we did within this project is we, so we, I, I said we we started with a sample, but we also decided like we we're, we're going to share everything because that's that's the assignment that we've gotten from the from the grant, which means we're going to share all the details with regard with regards to hardware implementation. Like a scanner was optimized for this, like a, a new scanner was built for this, an MRI scanner, but also all the, all the analysis methods. So FieldTrip was used for the MEG part, so most of the subjects were actually not scanned with MEG, only a subset of, of 100 subjects was scanned with MEG. Uh, all the others were also scanned with a, a 3 Tesla MRI, and a subset was scanned with 7 Tesla MRI. Uh, but the whole goal of the project was to share everything. So that was, that was quite kind of an eye-opener. And what we, what we did is we, so we, 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 sh we shared the data. We have different data releases. Uh, but we also share a lot of documentation. Uh, <coughs> the documentation on the different data releases, but we also document all the steps that we did in order to analyze this data. Oh, yes, you should. Oh, well, that's a bummer. <laughs> Sorry. So now it's mirroring. Now you see it, right? Yes, this is what you should have been seeing. So this is the this is now the homepage of the of the Human Connectome Project, which is now like grown into the Connectome Coordination Facility. Um, and the Connectome Coordination Facility is now coordinating multiple human connectome studies. The one that I was referring to is the HCP Young Adult one. So that's the one that started the whole thing off. Uh, within the HCP Young Adult one, we are sharing not only the data in different releases, but we're also sharing all the software and all the details. Like the we're sharing the stimulus presentation codes, we're sharing the design of the gradient coils used in the MRI scanner, we're sharing all the analysis pipelines, because we wanted to share everything from start till end. 
So that was for, <coughs> for me personally, it was like a big game changer because up to then I had never been so open about doing research. Um, of course, I was used to sharing my code, but this was actually about sharing much more. So what we did for the Human Connectome project, we, we had to design our analysis pipelines, not for the small scale, but we had to design the analysis pipelines for the large scales. And that's why we did over here, for the MEG pipelines. And we, during the course of the project, we made different releases of our <coughs> analysis pipelines. Um, so we made a, th so this is the one that we finally used for analyzing all the 100 subjects. But it's, it's this whole idea of planning uh, a project that was different than how it normally had done my research project. Because normally, we would just plan it along the way. Uh, and this was such a large endeavor that it actually had to be planned, uh, planned ahead. And I think that it's, I, I, I really learned a lot from this. And I think a lot of the things that, that applied here are actually relevant for how we're also doing science in smaller studies. So what I wanted to show you, actually, let me, so what I wanted to show you is, is this, this, this GitHub repository. I'll just go there. <coughs> Where we, in the end, uh, released all our code. So this is a bunch of scripts that was built on top of FieldTrip. And these scripts were then used for, for processing the data. So the data that we're sharing is the raw data, but also the process data. With the idea that the processing takes a lot of computation time, requires a lot of expertise. And what we want is that people, we want people to explore the data and the r results. So if people want to study the connectivity in relation to some genetic variation or connectivity in relation to like family structure, we want to offer them the connectivity matrices rather than the raw data. <coughs> uh, so that's what, what we did here is we had a certain strategy for setting up pipeline scripts where we basically do the different steps in the analysis and then we had like underlying code. But this is, this is something that we planned quite carefully um, let me quickly see. I'm not. I'm not going to show you the the pipeline, but we had. We had. Oh, actually, here I can show you the. Uh, no, this is not the right one. This is. Uh, <coughs> I think this one. No, oh, this one's broken. But this one's not broken. So we came up with a. Let's see if I can. <coughs> oh, yeah. <coughs> we came up with a with an analysis pipeline, which you can, like, more or less see here. So we had we had subjects in in the resting state condition and in three different task conditions. So also here, the subjects were in the images kind of for three hours in total. Um, and for the task data, we had a certain pipeline. <coughs> for the resting state data, we had another pipeline with, with many steps. So what you, what you should imagine is that each of these steps that we're doing here consists of multiple steps in field trip. So this is something that we planned. And this is also something where we share all the code for. But I also realized that, uh, so the, the idea was that if we share the code, then the code is going to be reused. But actually, the code that we developed was rather specific for the Human Connectome project. It's specific for the type of artifacts that we had there. So that's why I think that the code that is underlying these pipelines is not really that relevant for most of you, because it's too specific. So what I, what I want to show instead is, if we move to, um, if we do group analysis, we can also, uh, let's see, open heart link. We can actually better look at how to do group analysis um, at a smaller scale, because these, like these large scales with 50 PIs and a total of 100 people working in it and scanning a thousand subjects. That's basically it's it's not relevant enough for m the research that most of you will be doing. <coughs> so so last year we opened up a special issue in Frontiers, which is about doing group analysis in image in EG, and at this moment we're. Uh, still working on the submissions, but this is an interest. Uh, so this is an interesting special issue with already six articles that shows how to do 
group analysis, uh, which we like invited articles, invited written by others, um, including how to do group analysis in FieldTrip. So this is, it, it, it happens to be a colleague of mine in, in Stockholm, but he wrote this separately for me. I did not, I was not involved in this paper. And I, it's interesting to see how other people are doing the group analysis. Because I, I'm not claiming that I'm an expert in group analysis. And I think that in group analysis, we still have to learn a lot from each other. So what I, <coughs> what, I, what I would invite you to do is actually to look at these papers, to see how these authors are describing their analysis in detail, because here the request was actually describe how you did the analysis, not describe the results that you found in your analysis. Um, because here there's a number of different analysis pipelines have been set up on the basis of FieldTrip and on the basis of ME Python, on the basis of EEG Lab, on the basis of different toolboxes, with the idea that this is how you can do a nicely structured analysis. And what, what I wanted to show you in more detail is one that I made myself, and that's one, the one that I just like, can explain more easily. And that's one that you probably will recognize a little bit in the tutorials that you've been doing the last few days. And that is this one. And I'm here. I'm, I'm actually I'm showing two things. On the one hand, I'm showing uh, that the analysis pipeline is shared on GitHub, and the second thing that I'm showing is like how the analysis pipeline is structured. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll come to the GitHub thing later. Okay. So I first want to just like look at the way that the analysis is structured. And what you can see here is a whole bunch of scripts. The scripts are in one directory. Uh, but there's, some there's, a, there's a repeating pattern in it. So we have details for all 16 subjects. And then we have, for all 16 subjects, we have a script that runs the analysis for that subject. And on top of that, we have a script to analyze a single subject. We have a script to analyze a group. And I think that is a, that is so th this is how I organize this particular analysis with this particular data set. But I think that is a, a common strategy that you will see a lot of people uh, like developing is that you, you have to think about pipelines, the single subject pipelines, and then you have to think about group pipelines. So let me move to uh, MATLAB, and then I want just want to show you some of these uh, so some of these scripts. So the way that we, uh, at, at least the way that I often develop these pipelines, is that I start piloting. So my first scripts are typically very messy because I'm trying out things, I'm commenting out things. But at a certain point, I figure out like what is on the basis of my pilot subjects, I figure out like what's the best way to analyze the data. But I also figure out like where are the differences between the subjects, like perhaps subjects are not totally consistent or perhaps the stimulus presentation code uh, was not totally consistent between the different recording setups. So the trigger codes might have been messed up a little bit. Um, and then I start cleaning up those uh, those details. So here you can see, um, actually I can also show it here, I think. Um, here you can see the directory structure, structure that I use. So this is the direct this this is the, the organization of all the data, and here you can see the data for subject one. And this is a this is the data shared shared from uh, shared by by Rick Hansen from uh, Cambridge in the UK. Um, and here within the MEG directory, this is the files that I normally would care about. What you can see here is um, it's, an, it's data from an Electra MEG system. So there's raw files and there's um, SSS <coughs> files. So, so the data has been max filtered using uh, signal space separation. There's a T1 here. And if I go up, then here you can see my field trip scripts. These are basically the same scripts as I just showed you on, on GitHub. So if we look at the details for subject one, well there's a <coughs> few different places where I happen to have moved this data. But important is that I specify a number of paths, like where is the MEG data, where is the MRI, and where is the results for this subject. And then I specify the list of files that are relevant for this subject, and I might sp specify other things as well. And an important one is here, I'm reading the fiducial locations. 
because the fiducials, the place for the anatomical landmarks, they are different for each subject. And here the fiducials were provided by Rick in a separate text file. So this is something that I would do for every subject. For every subject I would have such a file. And that's also what we did with the sleep tutorial. Right? Um, the, the, this, um, I find it more, it's like I, I, I also usually have a directory for every subject. So that's why I also find it easy to have a file for every subject, because then I don't have to think where, where uh, like I can directly navigate to the correct, I can just by looking at the file name, I can, can, I can navigate to the details for that subject. If it would be a, a script that would have the details of all the subjects, it would not be directly obvious which script it was, because I would have a whole bunch of scripts probably, mm. and I would not know where it is. So, I, so for me, it's so sometimes I try to combine stuff within one M file, and sometimes it's split it. I think subject <coughs> details are something that I, I personally like to split between the different files, uh, in, in the same way as splitting the data over different directories. Mm. And then if you look at the Analyze Single Subject script, this is a a relatively lengthy pipeline. And I realized that if I want to run the script, I might not be able, I might actually not be interested in running every part over and over again. So that's why I have certain flags here at the start. So do, do some exploratory analysis, do anatomy, do pre-processing, and I can switch them on and off. Which basically means that I can run this script, and with a, with a very small edit, I can run this script for all the subjects, but only do one step. And that's where it's, like relevant, um, yeah, I, I'm going to wipe this anyway. So it's really cute. Yeah, let's, I'll just do it like this. I, I'll just keep the bottom part, okay? <laughs> no, you're still welcome. <laughs> so what, what we have is we have analysis pipelines for single subjects where we have multiple steps. Uh, so this would be for the different subjects, and then we have group analysis, where we then have different steps. Okay, so what this allows me to do is to specify one analysis pipeline, but still execute it as if I had implemented it like this. So that that allows me to very quickly switch back and forth between <coughs> looking at the details of one subject and running it consistently over all my subjects. Because in the end, what is important is that I want to have the results consistent over all my subjects. So this, this helps me to keep it consistent. So then if you, if you look a little bit further down in the code, <coughs> you basically for each of the blocks, you can recognize stuff that we've been doing in the hands-on sessions as well. So, all, uh, so we have not done all of these steps. Here I'm doing data browsing, here I'm doing pre-processing, so here I'm doing FTD fine trial, there's three conditions here with different trigger codes. Uh, the tr here the trigger codes were all consistent over all the subjects, so that's why they're hard-coded in this script. But had the trigger codes been subject-specific, then I would have put them in the subject script. So here, here at the top. I so what I, what I would <coughs> do is I would run the subject script prior to running this one. Actually, let me, let me show that to you. This is how we would run a single subject. And of course, what you can imagine, you can very easily... So here, I, here I'm avoiding for loops. Just here I'm re replicating the same script. And the reason why I'm replicating the same script is that I like to run this in a compute cluster. So uh, we have a compute cluster, it's actually opposite the hallway. And I can just take 16 nodes, and I can have one of these scripts run on each of the 16 nodes. So one compute node 1 would run this, compute node 2 would run this, etc. Yes, that's also what you could do, yeah. yeah. yeah so there's, there's many variations of this structure possible. So, I, I, uh, so you can eval it, you can, you, can, you, can, you can use sprintf to make the function name. You, you can make it smarter in many different ways. But the important thing is that I'm trying to split <coughs> the, the, the overall strategy basically in three things. There's subject details, there's pi algorithmic details, and there's a piece of code for running everything. And then, so what I do is I, ch I change the subject details, I change the algorithmic details, and then I run everything. And at a certain point, I just want to run it for all the subjects. And if, I'm, if the pipeline doesn't work, I change the pipeline and I run again for all the subjects. So that's why I'm, why why I'm 
often I'm splitting those three aspects of doing a large-scale analysis. And, I, I and then, of course, it, during the initial phase, I'm not splitting it. During the initial phase of piloting, everything is in one large script or in a bunch of scripts. And then I know I first have to execute this script and then this script, because if I do it the other way around, it's not going to work. So in the piloting, everything is fine. But it, this helps me to structure it. And this also helps me to run the analysis efficiently on our compute cluster. So that's more or less how, how, I, how I'm organizing my scripts. But I think it's interesting for you to also look at how other people are organizing their scripts. Because I'm actually not that, no, I'm, I'm not that skilled in doing a large analysis. I usually tell other people how to do their analysis. Right? So I have like, so Christian sitting over there. He's, he's, like a, he's a PhD student. He's recording subjects in the lab. He's doing the analysis. And then Christian might come with me with an algorithmic question. So I, what I, will, I will tell him, if you want to do your analysis properly, then you have to specify this config option here. And then, but I have no clue on how Christian is organizing all of this. But he, he's looking at th this type of stuff, and I know that his, his code is quite well organized as well. But he might have made different choices, and I think those choices would also be perfectly fine, because it depends on your experiment, depends on your programming style. But I think what is important is that you plan for it. That's, that's the point I want to make. Like it's not specifically about how I've planned for it, but planning for your analysis makes your analysis run much smoother. And if your analysis runs smoothly, then you will be more confident about the results. And that's what we in, in the end want. Okay, so that brings me here. So this is, of course, also where um, I, I am planning for, uh, th this is not our compute cluster, like this is just a photo that I grabbed from the internet this morning. <laughs> uh, ours is like, probably like two of these. Uh, <laughs> but still it's quite, a, it's quite a decent cluster, we have a lot of fun on it. Um, so I your, your analysis is really going to look different if you run it on the compute cluster or on the, on the laptop as, you've, as you brought here. But I think if you put a little bit of effort into organizing your scripts, it would not be too difficult to you do your pilot analysis on your laptop, which is also what I would do. And then once you want to analyze the data at a large scale, you move it over to a, like a more powerful compute environment. I think also like working with compute clusters, that's really a skill that I recommend that you learn. It's not about how fast you can compute, it's about um, convenience. <coughs> like I'm a, I'm a lazy programmer. I, I, I would pref I'd prefer computers to, to do work for me that I don't have to do myself. So one of the reasons I wear a field trip is because I'm lazy. I don't want to reinvent the wheel every time again. So that that's why we put stuff in an organized structure. So for me, running stuff on the compute cluster is much easier than running on a laptop. Because if I run on a compute cluster, I don't have to think about memory because our compute nodes have so much memory. Uh, so I'm, I'm lazy. Um, I don't have to think about how long the computation runs. Because if, if I know that if I run in a parallel, well, it can run for a night. That's fine with me. If it would run for a week, then I would start, I would start feeling worried. I might want to optimize it further. But I don't, care, I don't necessarily care whether my, com whether my computation runs for like half an hour or for two hours. If it's half an hour and if I have 16 subjects, well, that's one night. But if it's two hours and 16 subjects, well, then it's already one and a half day. If I would lose my, uh, if I cannot access my computer for one and a half day, well, that's annoying. So that's why I'm a lazy programmer. I prefer to run it on the compute cluster. Because then while the compute cluster is busy, I can just do other stuff. And of course, w whether you have such a compute environment or not depends a lot on your local situation. Here at the Donners, we have such a compute environment and it just makes life so much easier. We have a lot of storage attached to the compute cluster uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a place where we can also more easily work together. If I want, to look, if I want someone else to look along with my code or with my, my results, I just give them access to my directory on the compute cluster and then they can see it there. If I want to have people look along on my laptop, I actually have to make an appointment with them so that we sit behind my laptop at the same time. And that's, that can be challenging. So, so the compute cluster is not only for efficiency, but it's also for, co for collaboration. Yep, yep. Does, does 
Yeah, so we have uh, that, that. So we that, that's also a situation that ha that we had for the Human Coddington project, uh, where we were also using a compute cluster, like it had thousands of nodes and had one MATLAB license. So that was. <laughs> mm. uh, so, but also there we we switched to a compiled version of the code. So we actually ran the compiled version of the code on all our subjects. Here in Nijmegen, we've set up the compute cluster such that every compute node has a MATLAB license. Uh, so here in Nijmegen, we don't have that limitation, and it's actually something that's part of the design of our compute cluster. Uh, our compute nodes, they have a lot of cores. And if you ask, as a s so we have, compute no we have single compute nodes that have 64 cores. If you start 64 MATLAB sessions on such a computer, it only counts as one license. So w we're using the license structure that MATLAB provides in efficient use of licenses. So the university has some, th I think, some 300 or 400 licenses or so. But I know that I can start at least 100 to 200 MATLAB sessions here in our compute cluster that only take like five licenses. And that's what, that's what I'm doing if I'm doing really large-scale analysis. So our compute cluster is optimized for our specific use case. <coughs> and that, that, of course, depends on the compute environment. But m field trip, you, ca you can compile field trip. And you can use compiled field trip to run specific pipelines, but it's in the in the interactive phase of the pipeline development on the basis of pilot data. That's where I would not use the compiled MATLAB version. That's where I really want to have the interaction with the MATLAB editor and constantly being able to go back and forth, as we've been doing in the last few days. Um, so he, here at the Donners, uh, so he actually, actually I should say here at the DCCN, so here within this building, we have our own compute cluster that's being used by some, I'd say like some 300 researchers or so. And for those researchers, I am providing the latest version of FieldTrip on a, on a shared location. Um, at, the, at the Donner Center for Cognition, where Eric is working, they also have their own compute cluster. And I know that also there, so which is a smaller one, it's, it's, it's somewhere over there in, the, in another building, uh, and also there they have one field trip version. But actually I, th I think that in general I would prefer people to work with their own field trip version. Because I know that if, if, if you want to do an analysis and if you want to be sure about your results, and if you're analyzing subject one, two, and three on one day, and then the rest of the subjects on the other day, and if I make a change in field trip in, in the meantime, then you're the results might be different. It might be that I've fixed the bug, it might be that I've introduced the bug, it might be that I've optimized some code. So what I would prefer is that people would work with their <coughs> own filtered version anyway. But it's, uh, it's more or less a, as, a, as a convenience option uh, towards the researchers during the piloting that they always have the latest version. Because it's during this piloting that people often trying out different things. Uh, and that's also when they often contact me and then we, we discuss and I think, oh, we can, we can actually solve this by making field trip a little bit smarter. That's what we're constantly doing. We're constantly working on field trip. It's constantly making it smarter. Um, we control this in our pod settings. So when we start working on a project, at least I, I never take the most recent field trip version. I also take, always take a fixed one. Yeah. So we have all the field trip versions on our storage environment at the DCC. But we, fi we choose one which is not changing over yeah. the course of yeah. the analysis. Yeah. And if, if, if I run such a large-scale analysis, then what I would want is that I, I would want all my subjects to be processed with the same filter version, also with the same MATLAB version. So that basically means that ideally I would switch to a new MATLAB version and to a new field trip version at the start of a new scientific project. And then throughout the, that project I would stick to the same version. Is there any particular reason you're that concerned about the MATLAB version? Or is it just like compatibility? Uh, it, it's compatibility issues, but uh, um, it, it's it's m it's mostly compatibility issues. Uh, the, 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 the the difference that we see in MATLAB version mainly has to do with with plotting. That MATLAB plotting changes over the, over the course of time. The, co the computational details are not really that different. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but th th so th this this is one part. Like like 
developing it on a, on a laptop and then running it on a larger compute <coughs> environment. But actually one of the things that I really like to use there, and that's also what I'm, what I'm trying to introduce here more in the center, is a structured way of working with your code. And not only with your code, but also, for example, with field trip code. So what we, what we try to do is we try to use version control. And I think at this moment the best tool for version control is Git. And Git is the underlying software also used on GitHub. And, but Git and GitHub are two different things. GitHub is a website where, you where Git is made easy. And Git is so also something which, on the command line of my Mac, but also on the command line of Linux computers, there's a command line client. And on Windows computers, you have a graphical user interface on top of it. So with Git, I can very easily start a new repository. And I'm writing the pipeline as I'm going along. And every time that there's an, like an important I've reached an important state, I commit to that state. So I'm, I'm committing that version to my repository. I type some comments on like, this is what I've achieved. And there's something that I might do, for example, at the end of every day or at the end of a week, sometimes doing it even before lunch, because if I have reached really something important, I just want to safeguard it. And so uh, I'm constantly developing, like writing pipelines, managing s different subjects, running it for all subjects, and doing the group analysis. And at a certain point, if I'm, if I've, like ran the whole pipeline and if I have nice results then I don't only want to sh share and publish those results but I also want to share and publish that code. So th that's where I push my repository to GitHub or if I want to work together with someone and at, at that moment I push my repository git to GitHub so a copy of the repository is going to be made available on GitHub where other people can read along. That's actually how, how we're developing field trip. So I'm making a change to the codes, I commit it, and then I push that to, to the field trip repository on GitHub. So also, if you want to use field trip, the best way that you would use field trip is to, would to pull field trip from, from GitHub, because then you would always have the latest version of field trip, or you would have a very controlled version of field trip. And if you would want to run your analysis with a two-year-old version of field trip, you can pull a two-year-old version of field trip from GitHub, because it has been maintained on GitHub for already for quite some time. Git is not a, um, sorry, version control is not an <coughs> easy thing. Like version control, version controlling a Word document that you're sending around among all the authors, that's already a challenge. And, and, and luckily I'm in a situation that I don't have to do the version control. It's a, stu it's a student who's the first author that has to do the version control. He basically has to merge all the different suggestions from all the different authors which might be conflicting, etc. So version control in itself is a challenging process. Git is a software tool that helps you with version control. Git does not make version control easier, but it makes it manageable. So Git has a, like this, this I, I was told, I, I have not looked at it myself, but I told that the Coursera course on, on Git, that that's a really good one. Uh, it really explains version control in a very accessible way. And if you go to Software Carpentry, which is also a really cool project, they also have a very nice, like it's, Software Carpentry is a project on using software for science. Like not, s not s software engineering and computer science just for the sake of computer science, but developing stuff on computers for scientific questions. Uh, so on Software Carpentry there's a whole bunch of lessons, including <coughs> a lesson on, Git on GitHub. So I think this would be uh, like really valuable if you want to make your analysis more robust and reproducible, etc. Because like, why would we be managing our research data? Why would we be managing our research code? Well, we want to improve the efficiency and the quality of our research. Uh, I think it's important that we work together. So sharing data, but also sharing codes, I think that's important so that we can actually use, it, use the feedback from each other. So we, I think we can improve the quality of research. And what I also think is important, <coughs> and that's something that we're not doing enough yet, is to revisit research findings if we have new insights. Like a lot of data has been wasted over the last 20 years. It's simply not accessible anymore. And a lot of uh, really cool ideas have been developed. And then a paper has been published that has that idea. And then if you actually want to look up the details, well, it's not accessible anymore. So I think we should share, and ma we should manage research data and we should manage our code. Because I think, not only because publishers requires it and then funders require it, what, which is like one of the motivations that now people start doing it. But I think it's, it's just the right thing to do. I think this is really how we should move forward with, with science. 
some time ago I was reading this book. I don't know whether you know Neil Stevenson. He's uh, he's really a he's I, I really like a lot of his books. This was an interesting book. Like I, it's like totally not what I had expected, but it described how the Royal Society in the UK came about. So actually, so this is a this is part from the from the website from the Royal Society. So in the 17th century in London, scientists started to gather. They basically organized themselves a building and where they had meetings, and they would start discussing science. And at, at that time, science was <coughs> really in its infancy, like science as we know it now was it in its infancy. So they started doing all sorts of experiments, and they started describing the results of those experiments. They started discussing how to interpret those results, and people really had like totally conflicting opposite views. But they agreed upon the idea that science is something that you do together, and if you work together, that's actually how you make progress. Um, so, so in the early years of the, of the society, they, for example, they they published, <coughs> and they started publishing the philosophical trans transactions, where they published Isaac Newton's principle of mathematica and the, and the kite experiment from Benjamin Franklin. So really important stuff. But what, what I think is also really cool is that they basically gathered with a bunch of. I, I, I still have this feeling like a bunch of old guys. Uh, although at that time they probably were not so that old. <laughs> like if you if you now look at photos, it's always like these old grey-haired figures. But I think they had a, just a, like a bunch of very young, enthusiastic people that were gathering together and that they basically they decided how to work together. And I think that's the situation that we now also have in neuroscience. Like we are have, we, we're now like a bunch of young people and we can decide how we want to work together. So t some 10 years ago, Neuroscience was relatively fixed. Like you had to work in a particular way. The PIs would basically decide what was to, what was to be, to be done. But there's now really this movement that neuroscience has to change. So there is quite some fluidity. That means that we can now decide how neuroscience develops. That, that's why I think that these tools that I, that I was just referring to are really important because at this moment you won't find as much opposition to those tools. Like 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when I started sharing my software, people around me were asking, why, why would you bother? Well, you sitting here, that's why you bother, right? Because I think it really makes an impact. And I think that's also what your science can have. It can, it can make an impact. And I think the impact of open science is quite obvious. <coughs> so we have open educational resources, like the Fields of Wiki is one of these education resources. Like I've often pointed people to Wikipedia over the last few days, but there's a lot of other really interesting teaching material online. We have open access publications, we have, we might be slowly moving also to open peer review, like more open discussions on scientific findings. Um, of course, what I care about is, is open methodology, open source, and partially also open hardware. That's what I mentioned about the Human Connectome project, where we had to develop a new scanner, or improve a scanner, and not only like use the scanner, but also tell other people how to replicate these scanners, like how to basically improve their scanners. And that's, that's, that's kind of cool to that now multiple sites have a connectome scanner because they think that like multiple sites now are trying to copy the scanner because I think it's really a very well-designed uh, hardware design. So I think that's also important is that with open methodology, we're basically pushing the whole field forward. And that's also where open data comes. And I think open data, that's more or less links to open scripts and open strategies for working together. So like the, this is like a whole bunch of icons that you might know. And open data, that's relatively new. And I think open data might not be so known to you yet. But I think that's with the entry point where you can start, where you can start making a difference. So what I want to show you a little bit is like, how can you use open data? Or how can you contribute to open data? How can, can, you, can you contribute to open science? And I said like, I'm not, I'm not the expert on this, but I was, I've basically been thinking about this for quite some years because the Donner Center in its current shape, so we started some 15 years ago and at a certain point we became an institute, but then our university also got into some more challenging situation. I don't know who of you knows uh, the Stapel affair. St Stapel was a Dutch scientist, not from the University of Nijmegen, but from the <coughs> University of Tilburg, which is actually not that far away from Nijmegen. He was working, he was a social scientist, he was working together with people here in Nijmegen and he fabricated a lot of his data. Like it was really a very, 
very well-known Dutch scientist, really amazing results, and a lot of those results turn out to be like, totally fabricated. So one of the, so also Nijmegen was involved in, in this, like people in Nijmegen were involved in the investigations. So it became quite clear that if we want to continue with the neuroscience and the neuroimaging research here, we better make sure that doesn't happen again. Right, so what we, we, we have to make sure, yeah, so here it says, according to a study by Diedrich Stapel, this never happens in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that at this moment, I'm, I'm, we might not have the type of fabrication of data that Stapel did, but I'm pretty sure that we're making errors, that we're making mistakes, and I think mistakes are fine. We would just should be able to find those mistakes and correct them. So I think we should not have a, like a, a witch hunt for people that are doing false things. We should just see whether we can improve science, like with positive, in a positive way. And that's where, where openness comes in, because I think openness is really one of these ways that we can improve science. So open data and open content can be freely used, modified and shared by anyone for any purpose. But this is also where, in the type of research that we're in, I have a little bit of this tug of war between open data and privacy. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, um, looking at the paper, the, the kind of sub-level levels they give makes it quite hard to achieve. Actually, I'm trying to make a data set open, and I think of the, the list of 50, maybe I achieve having two or three items uh, as I would like to have. What's your experience or opinion on that one? I mean, besides describing your data, describing what you did, uh, is it feasible? I, th I, th I think it's feasible, but I think that we should not strive for perfection. I think we should do it in the best, like a field trip is not perfect. Like I'm, I'm always admitting that field trip has bugs. But I think it's still valuable that I share it, even in its buggy state that it's now in. And it's, 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 it's not that buggy. Because a lot of people have been looking along and have been improving upon it. So I think that also with data, what we should do is we should start sharing the data. And then people will start commenting on it. And then we'll <coughs> have, have a discourse on how the data should have been shared. And then the next time we share data, we'll share it in a better format. So I think we should like iteratively improve ourselves also in data sharing. And at this moment, it's indeed quite challenging because it looks as if the standards are really high. But I think we should start low. And I think everyone should, should start sharing the data to, to the best of their abilities. And I think that's the biggest gain that we would have. And then once we start this discourse on how data is to be shared, I th I'm pretty sure that will improve our abilities. And so one of these things has to do with privacy, because that's in, oh, it's always easy to point to open data, and if that open data is like, like doesn't have any harm in it. But uh, we're often working with data from human subjects, so privacy is a concern. So in one of the things that, w that we have with privacy is that we have a distinction that I'd, I'd, I like to make a distinction between data that we need from our subjects in order to invite them over to our center, that we, uh, that to reimburse them for them cost, we, we, we pay them a little bit for the time that they spend in the scanner. Um, but there's also reason that we, uh, we're asking for our general practitioner of our, of our participants, because if we have an incidental finding, we have to act upon that. So what we're doing is that for all the subjects that we're inviting, we're collecting some personal data, and not necessarily this list. But personal data is the type of data that you will record from, that you, that you have from a person that identifies the person. And so personal data is the type of data <laughs> that if there's a crime scene, the police officer would look for first. They would look for where they can find your passport or your ID. It's like a written document that has identifiers on it. So this is usually the data that our research doesn't really care about but it's still something that we acquire along the way. What our research cares about is the biometric data. But if, if they don't find your passport, what the crime scene investigation guys are going to do is they're going to look at biometrical data. They're going to look at facial details, they'll look at your dental record, fingerprints, genetics. So the, and, and then, of course, we're getting into a range of data that we are acquiring because of our scientific questions. So part of the data th that we are acquiring, part of the, the data that we require are acquiring for scientific research questions, is still identifiable data. It would still help a CSI investigator to identify the victim. So, it, so this is something that I think is uh, like you can you can take home that if if you if you if a CSI investigator could use the piece of data that you are recording. 
to identify the subject, then it's identifying data. And often a piece of, like a fingerprint by itself, is not identifying. But a fingerprint in combination with a fingerprint database, that makes the fingerprint identifying. So that's, that's how you often have to think about it. So if you then consider, like with the data that we're acquiring, there's a lot of research data where there's actually there's not much of a concern because it's simply, it's simply not identifying. I would say quite a lot of the EEG and MEG data falls in this category. Like it's functional data, if I record the same subject the second day, I'm just going to get a very, like EEG data looks pretty noisy, I would say. If I record the same subject the second day, it looks different noisy. And of course, there are certain patterns that I'm trying to identify from that data, but on the basis of those patterns, I would actually not be able to identify a subject, uh, unless for some extremer cases. But then we also have indirectly identifying personal data, and we have personal data. And for the personal data and for a lot of the research data, it's quite easy how to deal with it. Because on the one hand, you would just keep it private and you don't share it. On the other hand, you just share it as it is. And it's this, it's this middle section that's hard. I think that's one of these sections then in managing research data where we still have to learn and establish strategies for how to deal with it. And one of the strategies that we're trying to do is we try to limit possible identification. So with personal data, well, if, if, actually have, if you have to call your subject to invite them over for the scanner, well, you, 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 you cannot limit the identification. You, you still need his name and you need his phone number. What we, what we do is we restrict access to personal data. So we just make sure that only the person in charge of the experiment no, has the phone number. As a PI, I don't need to know the names of the subjects that my PhD student is inviting in the lab. Um, we protect the key that maps between the pseudonym. So we identify subjects by the pseudonym. We give them a code. And the code, the mapping between the code and the re real identity, that is protected. That's kept safe. Then we also have the biometric data. For biometric data, what we do is we, we try to use data minimization uh, strategies. So we try to only acquire the data and store and share the data that we need. So we're not going to record data that we're n we should not be recording data that we're not needing for the scientific question. And then we can acquire data anonymously, we can acquire data as a pseudonym, or we can use de-identification strategies. And I know that these three anonymous, pseudonymous and de-identification, they're often a little bit confusing. So I'll, I'll explain those in more detail on the next slide. But those are three important concepts. But a, a third thing to consider is there's also legal constraints. So not everything is done technically, but some, or at least what I would consider technically. Some things are actually done in, co in collaboration with the legal department of the university. So in a collaboration, we only give access to specific authorized researchers. And if we share data with everyone, we will only share it, the data with people that identify themselves, with researchers that identify themselves, that agree to a data use agreement. And the data use agreement is like a legal contract between me, who is responsible for the data for my subjects, and an external person who wants to use that data. And in the data use agreement, in the data use agreement that we're using, that we're recommending here within the donors, there's an explicit clause that states that the recipient of the data is not allowed to try and identify the subject. So if we were sharing a fingerprint, then the recipient of that fingerprint is not allowed to compare that fingerprint against the fingerprint database. And if that person, if that researcher would actually break that contract, he would, he, we could sue him. That, so that's, that's an important consideration. So there's also really the legal part need, needs to be clear, clear as well. Because we sometimes we seem, well, although we're not sharing fingerprints, but we're sharing cortical folding patterns, which are a little bit like fingerprints. Uh, the other way. So let, let's look in like the, the three terms that I already mentioned. Like, well, on the one hand, we have anonymous. And anonymous means that you never knew the subject's identity to start with. And it's quite challenging to record anonymous data. Um, Anonymous data would be if you would, like on the street, if you would interview people, and if you would just write down the answers. That would be pretty much anonymous. But as soon as you start collecting data through internet with web forms that subjects have to fill out, then it's not totally anonymous anymore. 
because then you would have their IP address. So, it's, so anonymous is really hard to, uh, to achieve with the type of data that we work with. Pseudonyms refer to changing the identifying features by codes. So pseudonyms have to do with the, with the passport, like because in the passport you can change the name. Pseudonyms don't have to deal with the, with the bio biometrical data, but have to do with the identifying data. Um, so what we do here in the center is that we use pseudonyms already at the moment that we schedule the subject in the scanner. So we schedule subject one, we schedule subject two. And at the scanner, in the scanner console, you select subject one or subject two. So the DICOM files actually never contain the name of the subject. Also in the case of the MEG, the MEG files never contain the name of the subject. But the most important thing is, is de-identification, because that pertains to the biological data that we're acquiring. And in de-identification, what we're doing is we're changing the biometrical data in such a way that we're removing the indirectly identifying features. So we are, for example, we're blurring the indirect personal data, defacing the anatomical MRI. We're replacing the age of the subject by age bins. Uh, we're, or, or we're replacing the date of birth by the age. That's, that would already be one step. And if you can replace the age by age bins. Um, and we, we can provide questionnaire outcomes rather than individual test item scores. Because that's also something like if you, would have, if you do an IQ test, if you just have all the answers, well, pretty much, you, if, it's, if it's a good IQ test, the subject would probably give the same answer the next time that he would do the test. So that basically means that also a pattern of answers on a questionnaire or could be identifying. Whereas if you provide the, the, the summary outcome of that questionnaire, you cannot identify a subject anymore. And of course, appropriate blurring depends on the situation. So if, if in, for the babies that we're studying, well, we would be describing them on one month bins, Whereas if, you were doing, if we were doing a study at, an, at a retirement home, you probably want to use five or ten year bins. And even then it would be difficult, like this is, this is the oldest person, I think, in the Netherlands. I'm, I'm not sure where I, where, what Google returned. Uh, but like if you would have, like in a retirement home, if you would have <laughs> one person that's 110, well, that's pretty much identifying, then you know who it is. So you might actually even have to use wider bins depending on your population. So, so blurring as, as a de-identification technique, blurring of of age or blurring of facial details depends a lot on the on the on the details that you have on the on the characteristics of your data. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So w no. With so the, the the blurring is really is removing some of the details, and that's the, and the, we're removing those details in this trade-off between the rights of the subject to, to remain unidentifiable unident and the, the scientific need. That also means that in some, some particular studies, I know that we will not be able to share the data. Or in some particular studies, we will not be able to share the data without very strict legal constraints on the sharing. I think the better we're able to blur the data, the more loose the legal constraints are going to be. And the worse we're able to, to blur the data, the more strict the legal constraints have to be. In the Human Conicone Project, we have two levels of legal agreement. The first level of legal agreement gives you access to the blurred data without certain sensitive features. The second level of agreement, which requires the director to sign, to send it as a fax, because the fax has a stronger legal status than clicking on the web page, also gives you access to drug usage details and to I think to partially to, to also to some criminal records type of stuff. So then it suddenly becomes sensitive. So that, that's why we have different levels of legal agreement. But I think it's it's really dependent on the type of data that you have, like how much blurring you can you can use. But it's, this is one of the skills that we still have to further develop. So if if you look back at this, well, so what we do is we basically, uh, if I put it to the side, we try to like split the part where basically that we don't want to share and for the part that is that is possibly identifying we try to make it more um, we, we try to remove the identifying features so we try to make this more green and the green part stays as it is and then this is how we try to publish it or try to share it okay so a little bit on, on like how, what does this the identifying what does that mean and how does that relate to the analysis that we're working on. So 
Here you can see uh, our imaging data, like the imaging data is for us the, biometri bi the, the biometric data that is really important, for, especially for MEG, for source reconstruction, but it's also the most identifying data. So this is an, a facial reconstruction from an MRI scan prior to and after deblurring. And at this moment, I do not have the tools yet to identify this person, but I'm pretty sure that someone will come up with these tools in the next few years. I'm pretty sure that someone will come up and then basically get all the profile photos from Facebook and be able to say which Facebook profile matches this person, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that's why I think that like that defacing is an important thing that you should consider. And here you see another defacing strategy where basically a chunk was taken out of the out of the head. I guess this is a little bit more coarse, but it, it also works. So what we, what we do is if we share the identified imaging data, we're removing the facial details. For example, using the filter function FTD face volume or the filter function FTD face mesh. But the consequence of this is that the nasion is missing, outline of the nose is missing, sometimes also the ears will be cut off because ears also are partially identifying. And it means that once you have the identified your anatomical MRI, we cannot do the co-registration anymore. Because the whole co-registration between the MRI and the MEG is based on these points. So, so what we do there, uh, so this is like the co-registration procedure, which you saw on Monday. Um, although, although this is this is at a different lab, but so what we what we do here is that we um, is a little bit more detail. So we have these anatomically recognizable points on the head that we depend on. So here at the Dons, we're using these ear molds. What we're doing is we're first identifying the position of these anatomical landmarks, and then we're saving the data such that the coordinate system saved with the data is relative to these landmarks. So here, the nation has been removed, but prior to removal of the nation, the data was co-registered. And what we do then, what we then do is we share the co-registered de-identified data. And of course, that's, um, so that's what we did for the Human Connectome Project. And then we got a lot of complaints from MEG people that wanted to use the Human Connectome Project data because they said, well, I want to redo the co-registration. And we said, well, you can try, but you're not going to succeed because we're not giving you the nose. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so, so that's also where we have to like, develop a uh, style of working together so you can just trust the co-registration that's provided. So here I think it's the, the blurring uh, already incur some, some trust relationship. Uh, if, if I said I've co-registered my data, you, would ju you just have to trust my word on it. In the same way, if I say that I'm sampling my, 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 my subjects from a representative population, you also have to trust my word for it. So this, this trust is already implicit in a lot of the scientific assumptions that we have and that we're making use of. So here, <coughs> because th there is still the question, like in what file format would you be sharing this and what, like how would the coordinate system be defined? But that, that's technical stuff that definitely can be sorted out. Why you cannot leave all these nodes? Hmm? Why you cannot leave all these nodes? Uh, uh, actually, it's an interesting one. We have a, we have a large data set here in Nijmegen as well, uh, so like an MRI data set. Uh, it's called the BIG database, the Brain Imaging Genetics Database, which has uh, genetics data and imaging data. So both rather sensitive data. There's very strict procedures for how people can access the brain data in relation to the new genetics. Some time ago, we had a researcher from the Max Planck Institute. He was interested in, uh, in the vocal tract. He wanted to know whether there were any genetic variations in the vocal tract in the way that people would actually use the vocal tract. So he was asking whether he could get the, not only the brain data, but he, whether he could get the vocal tract data. So that's actually where we reversed the whole thing. And we basically cut off the whole brain and only gave him the, like this part, like the, the <laughs> frontal part, <laughs> which, which was also, like, and he was initially was also not happy with it because he was used to looking at the whole head and for the whole co-registration, he, and he all, all of a sudden he only got the nose and the, and the throat. Yes, but that, that is something that you can do. I think the, the, the relevance of the, the nose is that in some of the MEG systems, um, the, um, we're not using three fiducials, but we actually we use scanning the whole head surface. And actually, here at the top, head surface is not very is not very pronounced. Like it's quite spherical. 
so it means that moving a little bit doesn't provide a lot of detail. The nose has a lot of anatomical detail, it's especially this curvature of the nose. So if, you, if we scan the head surface, we especially scan the nose. Uh, we scan the nose like this and we scan the eyebrows. Because those are the remarkable features that can actually be used if you do the co-registration of the head surface point that we record with the polyimus together with the anatomical MRI. But it's, which is like, so the, yeah, so the most pronounced features are also the ones that are most identifiable. So that's, the, so that's why here we, we, we could leave Nasian in. But it's actually it's more like that we that we might use the whole nose for the co-registration procedure. Okay, so um, then of course, so like once you have uh, dealt with uh, dealt with your data with identifying features in your data, you also have to start thinking like by which mechanism can I get this data uh, um, to the people that are interested in it. And that's, that's also like also an area where I think that we still have to develop. Uh, in back back in the old days, like in the 17th century, they started their own journal because they did not have an outlet for their ideas. At this moment, what I see happen, so you can think of Elsevier now as like one of these large outlets for scientific publications. So Elsevier, that's that's our that's also our outlet, or, or uh, Springer or other publishers. That are, those are our outlets for our PDFs for our documents. So, so the channels there exist and what, we, what I see now is that at this moment there's a lot of um, efforts in creating outlets for data as well but they're not ready yet. So at the Donners we have the Donners repository uh, which is like an institutional repository it's only for people working at the Donners Institute and in the Donners repository we can, sh we can archive the data that we want to keep for ourselves. We can also publish the data that we want to share. So the Donners repository started about a year ago, and we're now trying to get more and more people here at the Donners to start sharing the data, not only archiving the data, but actually toggling the switch such that the data can also be accessed by other people. And it might be that you have also that, that at your home institution you also have an institutional repository. Then there are like publicly accessible generic repositories. Generic because they don't really restrict the type of data that you would store there. And, and one that I really like, what it, it's, I think it's really well designed, is Zenodo. Zenodo, that's a project uh, developed by CERN. Like in CERN, they're really used to working with big data. <coughs> uh, so in Zenodo, is a like a data sharing site where you can upload data sets and you can freely, like without any hassle, you can upload up to 50 gigabytes. If you want to upload more than 50 gigabytes, you have to send them an email and you have to ask. And if you ask them, you say, well, this, this is the data, they will say, okay, fine. And then you can upload 100 gigabytes, 200 gigabytes. I, I think it's really cool. Um, the, the, the good thing about Zenodo is also that it's being supported by CERN, and CERN is not going to disappear in the next 20 years. So the data that you're going to upload there is going to be persistent. Well, and that's important, is that the data remains available. Another one is Harvard Dataverse. So Dataverse is a piece of software developed by a by a specific group at Harvard, and they made an instance of Harvard Dataverse available. Uh, so ma they made an instance of Dataverse available that everyone can use. So part of our older Donners collections are shared there as well. And then, of course, there's um, like more specific efforts such as Data Dryad, which is like a it's like a, a d data publication site. I think what is, what is an important like you, you you can basically pick the one that you like. Uh, but I think it is, it is important that you look at the legal constraints. Data Dryad requires the data to be shared under the public domain dedication. So that basically means that you're giving away all the rights to the data. That is something that at the donors we're not allowed to do. At the donors we are required to protect the identity of our subjects. So with the data from our subject we cannot give away the rights. Because if we would give away the rights, then everyone would have whatever rights that person would have, that, that the recipient of the data. So we cannot protect the identity of the subjects if we upload it to Data Dryad. So that's just something to be aware of, that I your data, you should share it in under the constraints that are appropriate for, for your institution. And then there's also specific repositories. And then like for genetics, the repository already exists for a long time. For astronomy or for astrophysics, like people have been sharing, people have been sending around tapes with data in astrophysics for a long time. Like data sharing is so much more mature there than within neuroscience. Um, 
And Open, Open fMRI is one of these fMRI projects where a lot of data is already being shared. Okay, so it is a bit challenging to think about like w what type of repositories are, ex are available through which you can publish your data. Um, this is, a w uh, I'll, and I'll be sharing these slides afterwards, so, but this is, a this is a repository of data repositories. So if you want to search for a data repository where you might, then this is where you could search, like for a data repository where you would want to share your data, but also for data repositories where you might find data that you can reuse. In the Netherlands, we have Narcis. Narcis is also one of these scholarly systems th that are trying to collect all the research information from the Netherlands. Elsevier is also trying to make data more accessible, so they have a data search tool. But if, if I now look at it, then it's, it's pretty much like in the old days of internet, like some ten, this, this is, fi actually this, this, these were, I, I searched for Yahoo in 2000, so 18, year old, 18 years ago. And Google did not exist yet, right? Which is weird to imagine, but like it, it simply didn't <laughs> exist. <laughs> um, at that time, there was this, this, like this registry and everyone could make an account here. And what, what basi basically people were doing is people were making, keeping an index of the whole internet. And you could click on one of the categories and then you would find subcategories and sub subcategories and there were people maintaining this whole thing. Uh, and we, we had a similar thing in the Netherlands, which, is <coughs> I, which at this day still, still exists, but I don't think anyone's using it anymore. It's called Startpagina. Uh, my feeling is that at this moment, especially if you look at uh, like this repository of data, repo it's a bit, little bit like this. And, like, and we know where this went, like you didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Google took over. Uh, I'm pretty sure that with data, well, very soon we'll, we'll be in a situation that data is going to be much more accessible than it is now. Not only where, where to find data, but also where to store your data. It's because at this moment, it's still a little bit challenging to find, a, find the best place to, to archive your data and to share your data. But I think we're, we're in the position that we have to get started. And if we start sharing our data, then we'll get rid of these bulky things like pretty soon. And then data will be as open as we now consider the internet to be open. Yes, in Nijmegen participants, so in, in Nijmegen, of course, we're working on the specific ethics regulation, so the, <coughs> uh, and the ethics board in Nijmegen requires that participants give consent. In the general ethics approval that we have for, for adult subjects with non-invasive studies, so including our fMRI and EEG and MEG studies, we have a, an opt-out thing, which basically means that the subject, that the subject opts out of the experiment. So if a subject does not consent to sharing his data, the subject is not going to participate. And we're in the situation that we have enough participants, so we, if a subject, if we, we can easily find subjects that want to participate. So we do not want to go through the hassle of having to sort the data in data that we can share and data, data that we cannot share. But that's only for the general approval that we have here in Nijmegen. For all the speci more specific studies, so for the interventional studies, so the drug studies, or the, the brain stimulation studies, we're asking for specific uh, ethical approval, and then we also have specific informed consent procedures. And especially once you start doing dealing with patients, well, and it becomes more, much more difficult to have have this strategy. Like, if a patient doesn't want to share the data, I'm not going to use him. So, for for patient studies, it's it is more uh, more a concern. So, so it, so it depends, and it's something that you have to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. So for also for the um, so so for, for the for the for the big project, <coughs> the brain imaging genetics projects, there are people. So which which is we've been acquiring data for the last ten years. Uh, so there we're allowed to share the data only after uh, an internal scientific review. So for the big data, we actually have a special procedure. For the data that we're now sharing, we also have different data use agreements. Some data use agreements are more lenient, some of data use agreements are more strict. Uh, so it, it I know it is challenging, also I'm also confused by it, but it's, it is something that we'll simply have to learn, like we all have to learn, it's like how to deal with the ethical considerations. And I think it, it is important that you realize that the informed consent form that the subject is signing, that is the, con the, that is the contract between the subject and you. And the data use agreement, that the recipient of the data is signing, that is the contract that you have 
with the recipient of data and you. So as a researcher, you're in between of the subject and the person who's going to use the data. And you have to be aware of both. So I think it's really important that you have a closer look at your inf informed consent procedures to see what's, what actually subjects are allowing you to do. More people to use your data, yep. data then yes adding such videos yes video. yeah, it's like it, it, it's not it's we should not only be sharing our data we should also be documenting our data yeah. that's that, that's important documenting our data to the ex and i also hope that you all brought documentation for the data that we're going to work on in the playground session like uh, not necessarily videos but at least some powerpoint slides etc that's what we've been asking for but like documenting your data is really one of these important things that we still have to learn uh, which is not trivial if w what you're saying is like if you show the video of how the procedure works, well yeah, there's so much information in there. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, just on the point you're saying about it, it being important about learning about data sharing and open access, um, what about the pieces around like the 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 most Yeah, I th I th it, it is also something that in, in the new, uh, like the EU training programs, at, uh, at least the ones that I recently applied for, it is one of the explicit training goals that, we've, that we're going to further develop. So we're going to train our young students, like uh, the, the young the early stage researchers, also how to write data management plans. But it's, it's challenging. I, I never wrote them myself. So as such as, a, as someone in charge of, uh, like responsible for the training, I don't know yet how to develop this. So I think that's also something I have to like, jointly develop this expertise. And then, of course, in, in the UK, there's really good examples. Like, there's a lot of support in the UK for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, DMP Online is one of them, yeah. It's really nice. No, so that's, uh, that's a tool that helps you to make a data management plan. So there's a, a, like a lot of stuff is, is currently being developed, is already being made available to help you through this whole open science thing. So thi this is, like, I, I know that there's many more details that I could go into, but this is what I more or less had, 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 had planned for this session. I realize that I've already taken much more time than I actually had planned. Um, but the, um, I think w what, I, what I hope is that I've conveyed is that da the data sharing is not something that is easy. It is something that we're all, like, new to, and it's something that we jointly have to develop our skills. Working together is something that we're not necessarily explicitly trained in. Working together on, like working together with colleagues at this moment, that's something that we're trained in. But working together with people that in the future want to use your data, uh, that's that's an important thing. One, one thing that I always keep in mind myself: if I'm writing my code, I'm writing it for my future self. So I'm I'm documenting the code <coughs> in a way. It's like if I would look at this code in ten years from now, would I understand it? So what I'm basically doing, I'm thinking of a collaboration with my, with my future self. <laughs> so I think co collaborations really help in, to, in thinking, like thinking about collaboration really help in like how should you document. Like documenting your code is important, documenting your data is important, and also making sure that the code and the data remains accessible in the long term, that's also important. And it's really fun, like sometimes I come across a, or, or like a piece of code that I wrote like 20 years ago that's somewhere like hidden, somewhere deep inside field trip. I think, oh, that's actually a nice piece of code. And even I even bothered to document it. Uh, so that, that's also something that I hope that you will also adopt as a strategy that you actually think about, like, that you plan ahead. And planning ahead is, for example, documenting. <laughs> that you just write down what your plan is. We, we, we format it similar, but at the time that we started with sharing the codes, uh, um, Mar Markdown was not popular yet. At this moment, I'm considering a switching to another wiki system where we would use Markdown. Uh, so the, c the current wiki is based on uh, DokuWiki, which is a German open source project. Uh, and I, I picked this particular wiki system uh, because it did not have too strong <coughs> constraints on the server. <coughs> It doesn't have a database, but it has text files. Uh, and it has a very nice formatting style for code. 
and I knew, I knew, that, I knew that we would be have to document a lot of code. So that's why we picked this one. But at, at this moment, I would not pick it again. I would, I would go to a different strategy. But it's also something that develops. Also with GitHub. So at this moment, I would say I would use GitHub. But in the past, I've been using Subversion. And prior to that, I've been using CVS. So it's just so, uh, also these tools are constantly developing. Um, and that's something that you just have to accept that you're, at this moment, you're learning certain tools. Or primarily, you're learning skills. And these skills will transform for other tools as well. Any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, that is a good one. Yes, yes, yeah. I, th I think that that's where we still, uh, so f I, at the code share, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to get more people to share the code, but I also realize that it's difficult. And I know that over the years, I've learned how to use a version control system. And then if I like take five or 10 minutes at the coffee machine to try to explain someone how version control works, I, I totally fail because like it's, it's, t it's too complex. It is something that you have to grow into. And at this moment, I'm not yet sure which tools would be the most useful for which level of expertise. So Git, I really like Git and I really like GitHub because it's a very graphical way of exploring codes. But I also know that it's still quite challenging for people that don't know the concept of version control yet. So that's where I'm, uh, where I'm s I, I, th I think we definitely should go for more openness, but I think that part of the tools that we need for that still need to be developed or still need to be further refined. Oh, yeah, Open Science Framework, OS, OSF.io, <coughs> really, really cool site, go, go, go look at it. Uh, I, I think Open Science Framework is a really nice initiative. Uh, it's, it's ha has a very, th a very good backing behind it. I, I can quickly go there, I can show you. Uh, no, I should actually, I should sign in, otherwise I can't sh show you that much. Uh, this has um, like a relatively secure authentication, so I quickly have to look up my. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this is this is a one-time password actually, and I, I I was just in time for typing it in because it already expired. So that like this is a, this is like a one-time password which changes every every twenty seconds or so. So, but th these are some uh, some some projects that I've tried out. So I'm, I'm still exploring whether OSF is useful. Uh, this is one like a like a relatively large uh, project where we have uh, working together with a whole bunch of people. Um, but also this like open s uh, the open science framework. Like you can you have you have wiki pages. Um, uh, uh, so we ha we have a Skype meeting, so we can like have the minutes. We we shared some code, <coughs> we shared some data, and then we hear there's some like some description of the data that we shared, and this is also linked uh, to uh, a GitHub repository where we're managing the code, and then we also have the data uploaded here. But also this is something that uh, it, it is a di it's slightly different style of working than I would normally use. So it depends on w with the people that I'm working with whether I would use this or whether I would rather use a shared Dropbox or a shared Google Drive, for example. And I would not be sharing any sensitive data through Dropbox or, or Google Drive anyway, but I might be sharing code or might be sharing presentation code or analysis code. So, b so, so b this is indeed also like a really nice platform to work on. But perhaps this is something that we can explore more in, more in detail tonight, where we're going actually going to have like more time to sit behind computers and do stuff that is, that is slightly unusual. <coughs> 